Thank you very much, Charlie, for that uh, very nice introduction. I appreciate you uh, signing up today for this webinar. It is really a pleasure uh, to be back here and uh, to talk about something that is very interesting for most uh, uh, growers and retailers alike, and it's about uh, advertising and promotion. And what I'm going to be doing today is, uh, let me start the recording here before we go through. All right, so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to give a little introduction about uh, the uh, overall vertical market system and uh, just give a little background information about promotion and advertising and uh, differentiate between different type of goods and how can we as, uh, as advertisers, as, as selling our products, look at the products and how can we uh, stra uh, put a strategy together for promoting our products. And specifically, what we're going to talk about is the main difference between generic and brand advertising. And I know that the overall umbrella of generic advertising, most of you are familiar with some programs uh, about generic promotion programs. In fact, the industry have had a couple of those through the years, uh, namely uh, Flowers Alive with Possibilities and also Promoflor have been the two big generic programs. But you also are familiar with other generic uh, promotion programs for uh, commodities such as milk, uh, beef, pork, and several fruit and vegetables. So we will talk about what's the difference and what are some of the requirements in order for each one of these uh, 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 type of promotion programs to work. And then I'm going to go in and specifically talk about uh, a mixture, not really talking about pure generic uh, promotion programs or pure branding, because in our case, when we look at the data, it was essentially looking at, well, what are the type of promotion and advertising activities that people do in the green industry? And we used the, the National Nursery Survey data to look at those. And then we asked the question, what sort of advertising and promotion programs work best? And what we discovered is that not only uh, promotion and advertising were successful in increasing uh, uh, overall sales, but we also took a look at what are the type of promotion activities that work the best depending on the size of your firm because what may work for somebody who's a small grower might not be the same or might not have the same impact as somebody who has a, a very large multi-million dollar production uh, facility. So that's what we're going to be concentrating on today is looking at well, what's the return on investment for every one dollar that we spend on different promotional activities and where can I put my money to maximize the returns in terms of additional sales. Now what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be concentrating in the results. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, looking at the math and all of the econometric models, but we will, uh, if you're interested in that part, uh, we will give you some information where you can get the full uh, article that was recently published in the Journal of Environmental Horticulture, and you can look at how the methodology of how we estimated those elasticities, and they came up uh, with with the actual returns, uh, benefit cost analysis with the actual returns for every dollar invested in promotion uh, activities. One of the key challenges when we do so is trying to isolate those effects from anything else. For example. Um, how do you know that those the increase in sales was due to those promotion activities and not because there was some structural change or maybe because there were some other changes that were not specifically at, uh, that we cannot attribute to uh, promotion and advertising activities and then that's why I have that question there does one side fits all and what we will see is that it doesn't and it depends on the size of your firm and different promotion activities uh, have highest returns and we'll talk about that and then finally I'm going to provide just uh, uh, an example about how to think about some uh, promotion and advertising and how to uh, be envisioning this new era of a consumer driven economy. In agriculture in general we've always had the uh, paradigm of going from the farm to the plate and uh, I think that's the main mentality issue that uh, we need to change is going from, well, I'm going to grow what I like and then I'm going to try to sell it 
and, and now uh, we have to have a more marketing, a more consumer oriented approach in asking what do people really want to buy and how can I satisfy those needs uh, with my products and services. So the vertical marketing system, it's very uh, simple. We go as producers uh, and, and, and some of us here today might be uh, growers and might have some uh, landscaping business and maybe some retail operations. Regardless of that, uh, the, the flow of products goes from the producer or the grower all the way to the final consumer, whoever that might be. But there are certain uh, regulations and cer there are certain uh, information that is exchanged throughout that system. And uh, in order for us as growers to maximize sales, we need to make sure that the consumers are well informed and we have conducted studies that show that a very informed consumer typically spends more and is looking for products that are higher quality. Now there is a very important differentiation when we talk about our products in the green industry. Because when we talk about traditional food products and we think about promotion programs, we usually have some sort of a differentiation factor. And my good friend Charlie Hall has been talking about uh, how to try and be different. There are three ways in which firms typically compete, either by volume and price, by being different, or maybe by having some sort of an integration in that vertical system that we talked about. So usually when we talk about food and traditional agricultural products, we emphasize some features regarding the origin of the product, regarding uh, uh, features, for example, organic foods, but it all has to do with satisfying nutritional needs and things that people really are necessities for them to live in terms of agricultural commodities. When we talk about aesthetic products, such as the one that we sell, the motivations for buying these products are slightly different. So when we put together promotion programs, the appeal for those products has to be a little different than traditional food crops. Now, what we need to determine in terms of any promotion activities, and when I say promotion, I'm, I'm, and we will talk about those different uh, issues, and I'm going to show you some data so you can compare your firms with the actual national average of what people are doing, but essentially we need to, uh, to answer the following question. What needs to be said? What's the message that you want to convey? Uh, what's the range of alternative messages? Who is really the audience? Are we going to uh, provide some information regarding uh, uh, the different uh, way, the uh, quality of the product, maybe some service? Are we going to provide some information about how to take care of the product? Uh, technology advances have allowed us to do that very easily. Now, by the use of a very simple phone device, we can incorporate QR uh, codes that are those square, for those of you who are not familiar, are those square, uh, uh, kind of like a barcode uh, squares that you can actually direct people to a website and you can suggest which plants will go well in different conditions and then you can give some information about how to take care of those products. So all of that uh, provides uh, uh, adds value to your products, not only by the product itself, but adding value and service and differentiate and making yourself different. And what message are you going to do? And if you do these type of activities, the most important thing that you need to do is let your, cons you, your consumers know about that. Make it easy for them to come back and look at that. If they like something, make it easy for them to come back and purchase your, the products from you. And we'll look at that here in a few slides, but we'll see why is that important. But most importantly, and the focus of today's presentation is what's the likely impact? If I invest money in doing this activity, does it pay off? And that's what we want to answer the question. So in general, when we talk about promotion and advertising activities, there are two types of, of promotions. There is the generic advertising and brand advertising. When we talk about generic advertising, you can think about the general issue, and I put an example here of orange juice. And a generic promotion program is looking to increase overall demand for that specific product without, without changing the market share of the firms. So if you think about it, you to, you're trying to increase the size of the pie, but every slice 
is, is, if it's done correctly and if you have the characteristics of the products for a generic promotion program, then the slices, the size of the slices uh, remains exactly the same. It's just the overall size of the pie that is trying to be increased. On the other hand, brand advertising, what it's trying to do is not really trying to increase demand. Uh, it's not the main purpose of, of brand advertising. But brand advertising's uh, objective is to try to increase the size of, of that uh, uh, slice. In other words, it's just trying to increase the market share of uh, that specific firm. So uh, again, generic advertising is trying to increase total demand, keeping the market share the same, and brand advertising is trying to increase uh, the market share. Now in our case, when we promote products, we're not particularly promoting a single brand in our firm. So if you think about your overall business, yes, we are uh, starting to have more and more uh, awareness from the consumer by different uh, brands specifically, but when you think about your promotion activities, you're really promoting all of the products that you grow. So it, it's not really uh, under any one of these uh, activities. Now if you think about it, what are the, uh, the definition exactly of and what some of the requirements for a generic advertising program to work? Well, uh, a generic promotion program, uh, it's a cooperative effort among producers and one of the key things here is that they produce an homogeneous product. If you want a generic promotion program to work, you have to have a product that is relatively homogeneous and then you disseminate that information to try to increase demand. Uh, on the other hand, brand advertising, uh, you have a product that is heterogeneous, that is very different and it's easy to uh, differentiate that product. In economics, we refer to that as elasticity. And you, you want to make your products more inelastic in comparison to your uh, competitors. In other words, you want consumers to be less sensitive about a price increase of your products. So if you increase the price, you want those consumers to buy your products because they perceive and they feel that your product is different, that it's of higher quality and the services that you provide are much better than your competition. Now one of the uh, key issues in marketing is that if you come up with a good way of differentiating your products, if it's a really good idea, then uh, people are going to copy that. If it was indeed a very good idea, uh, they're going to copy that and then in a few years uh, you would be back at the same situation where everybody's doing the same and you no longer have a differentiated product. So I've said this in the past and I think that the only constant they are in our business is change. And you have to constantly be uh, reinventing yourself and asking the question, what is the next thing that I'm going to do differently? and be thinking about one or two steps ahead of everybody else. Now, uh, certain characteristics of the products, uh, there are two type of products, uh, experienced goods and search goods. The difference between these two is that experienced goods are typically the cost associated with learning about these products is so small that you rather just try the product as opposed to do some extra investigation. And those are the type of search goods, for example, when you're going to buy a car or a very expensive uh, electronic a TV or maybe appliances, you want to make sure that what you're buying, it's, it's, it, you, that you've done your homework. So you go and look at consumer reports, etc. Most of the products that we grow uh, fall some of them in between. Uh, it's not like you go, for example, to a store and you see a new brand of juice and say, I'm going to try it. And it's just easier uh, to do that because you might have somebody with the exact same demographic profile and, and two people liking two brands. So one person might be exactly the same demographic as another, but one prefers Coke to Pepsi. So that's why it's so important uh, to have this uh, differentiation between experience and search goods. As I mentioned before, most of those are uh, typically uh, either uh, considered to be experienced good or somewhere in between depending on which, which type of products we talk in our industry. Now there are another important differentiation is cooperative goods and predatory goods. Cooperative goods, you can think about them 
sort of like those products that, that will be more uh, suitable for a generic promotion program. You have those products and when you promote them, you generally have an overall increase in demand, but then again, the size of each uh, uh, portion in the pie remains the same. And predatory goods are those who tend to actually take over and take over uh, the market share of everything else and not really increase sales overall. So if you think about that in your, in your businesses, if you have certain products that if you put them there, they're going to go, but not necessarily generate enough traffic so that you get additional sales. So in our, um, in our industry, in the green industry, when we look at these uh, effects of promotion and advertising activities, we will look at somewhere in that green area. Somewhere in between, it's not really purely a generic advertising, uh, but it's not really a brand advertising either. Because by promoting your products, by promoting uh, your firms, you're actually creating more uh, awareness. And when I, I usually tell um, growers and, and retailers alike that you, you, you should think about yourself and your competition not necessarily being other growers, but you might also want to take market share from other sort of aesthetic products. So you might think about how can we enhance and get some market share from other industries besides the green industry. So from that standpoint, when you do your firm promotion programs, you're uh, increasing the overall demand for the products. But you also want to make sure that you get the return uh, on your investment for your particular firm. So it's also sort of a brand uh, advertising uh, idea. So when we think about it, what we're going to be looking at is that uh, green uh, area there in the center, somewhere in between. Now, how do you plan for that? Where there are several things, there are five things that you should look at. The first one is the message. What is the purpose of me putting these promotion activities? Then the media, what are the methods used for communication? And this is very important. We're going to be talking about what sort of media returns do you get depending on the size of your firm. And then the coverage, who's the audience? Uh, how much time is going to be uh, spent? And uh, finally, some of the coordination about those, those messages. Now, we briefly talked about how do you measure the effectiveness of a program. Well, the first challenge is trying to isolate the effects of promotion programs because there might be many things that are changing sales uh, from a recession all the way to uh, many other issues. So the challenge is to try to econometrically isolate those effects. And once we do that, we, we, we can look at what's the response that consumers have to different uh, programs. And uh, the data that we uh, used for this analysis was the National Nursery Survey. And most of you are probably familiar with some of the results of this uh, National Nursery Survey. Unfortunately, because of time constraints, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the survey itself. I'm just going to provide a little overview, a two minute and two seconds overview of of, of the uh, data that's available there and then we will provide you with a link where you can go and uh, obtain the, the uh, full reports about not only the general results but also the results of the uh, economic impact. So you can go and take a look at those and compare yourself to the national averages, compare yourself with other uh, firms in your, in your uh, growing regions. So just a little bit of background information. Uh, this survey has been conducted by the Green Industry Research Consortium uh, for, uh, this is the fifth survey. So we had the first survey back in 1989 and uh, we surveyed about 23 states representing 75% of lower cash receipts. That went up to about 24 and 22 in 98. By 2004, uh, that survey was uh, having a sample of 44 different states. This is especially important now uh, that uh, that NAS had discontinued the uh, nursery uh, survey report that used to have information about sales and 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 uh, relative prices and everything else. So we no longer have that information. 2006 was the last year where we had that information available. So now this survey it's more crucial because it's providing a lot of information. 
In 2009, we conducted the survey, and some of you might remember filling it out. Uh, it has information about sales, uh, employment of full-time and part-time uh, employees, production and marketing practices, uh, regional trade, and some of the influencing factors in terms of making decisions about uh, uh, pricing and other, and other important marketing issues. We compile information for the first time in all 50 states from either National Plan Health Boards, the State Department of Agriculture, we had about 38,000 different businesses in our uh, database. And then we did a stratified sample. Uh, part of it was a mail survey. And then uh, we also had a, a version that was an email uh, portion. And then we are still strategizing uh, about uh, the next survey that will come up in the next couple of years and whether we will want to go to a full online version. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but you can go through uh, greenindustryresearch.org and you can get a copy of the full report. And you can also get a copy of the uh, not only the general trends, but also the, the uh, economic impact series report in that same uh, website. Now, when we talk about different regions, this is the breakdown of regions. And you have Pacific, and largely in part because of California, is the top region. And then you have uh, the Southeast, uh, mainly because of Florida, and of course, the South Central. But you have a lot of states where um, the green industry has become the top, or one of the top two or three uh, agricultural sectors for many states. If you uh, look at, for example, and uh, the reason I want to emphasize a little bit about this is to provide some background information about competition, hyper-competition, and why does it make sense to do promotion and advertising activities. This is the breakdown of uh, the year where firms have been established. And as you look at this, you can see that there are firms that have been in business for a long, long time, over 100 years or more. But what's important here, and I want to show you, is that about 44, almost 44 percent of the firms have only been in business for less than 10 years. So keep that in mind. There are a lot of new firms coming into the industry. So that's immediately tell me a story. Maybe there is a lot of entry and exit. Why? If you look at the trends for sales back in the 70s and 80s, our industry oftentimes had a double-digit growth in sales. And whenever somebody sees a business that it's growing, that it's expanding, they say, well, maybe there is money to be done here. And we have attracted a lot of new firms. So keep that in mind. We have a lot of new firms coming into the industry. And this is the breakdown by region of those, uh, uh, the number of people in the survey, and et cetera, some of the background information. But this is another slide that I want to show you. So you, in, in one hand, you have uh, a lot of new, recently uh, uh, firms in the industry. And this is the breakdown of annual sales. So if you look at this, for example, the first category are those firms who sell less than $250,000. And the graph on the left with the yellow uh, bars, that's the number of firms in the industry. So you have about half of the firms are very small firms selling less than $250,000. However, the graph on the right shows what's the share of total sales for the industry that that group represents. So even though we have half of the firm, uh, half of the firms uh, selling less than $250,000, they only represent 1.8% of total sales. And as you go and look across those uh, sales categories, you look at the last one, for example, is firms who sell over um, 50 million, and then you have those firms almost selling a third of the overall sales. So putting that picture together, you have a lot of new firms, most of them very small firms, but they're so small that they're competing against each other. And the, the way that usually this firm competes by differentiating some, uh, some of their products. Now, this is the breakdown, the summary of, of sales. We are a very large industry. We estimated that total sales for the U.S. were about $27 billion. And this is in 2000, uh, 
2008. So unfortunately, this is prior to the recession. We're currently working in a, in a paper looking at the effects of that the uh, recession had in, in the number of firms and also in terms of sales. Uh, I want to show these slides just for your information. I think it's, it's kind of useful because we've seen many states that have had a, a substantial increase in, in sales and that have, where green industry has become a very important industry in the, uh, in the agricultural sector. But the top five states are California, Florida, Texas, Pennsylvania, Georgia. Those five states have sales of more than $1 billion. And then you have a, a lot of other states that follow very, very closely. So the green industry has become a very important industry. Uh, this is the market channels used. Again, uh, most of the, uh, the the graph on the left represent the share of respondents selling to those market channels, and the graph on the right represents total sales. So almost a third of the firms sell their products to landscaping firms, 21.9 to single uh, location garden centers, and 21.3 to re wholesalers. Uh, this is another one that is very important because uh, it highlights the uh, importance of promotion activities and, 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 and who is your real audience. And what I want to show you here is that first uh, graph there, about 85.6% of respondents report having repeat customer sales. What percentage of that of the total sales is to repeat customers? About 80% of their sales. This is very important because we conducted a study a few years ago looking at what's really driving the demand for green industry products. And what we found is that most of the increase in demand is, is driven by new customers. So yes, increasing total demand is driven by new customers, but the bulk of the business is conducted by those who keep coming back. And the question we wanted to answer is, is the demand really increasing because you have new people who didn't purchase our products before that are buying the products, or is it driven because those who buy the products increase their intensity and buy more? And what we found is that the bulk of the business is really in repeat buyers. And it's substantially less expensive to try and keep the customers that you already have than trying to go and find new customers. Now, what sort of different advertising and promotion media were people using? What we found is that the average was about four percent of total sales was the amount of money spent on promotion and advertising activity. Four percent was the national average. So for a firm that sells a hundred thousand dollars on average they will spend about four thousand dollars on promotion activities. What was the breakdown? Well the graph on the left shows the amount of firms doing those type of promotional activities and then out of that 4% of total expenditures in promotion, that graph on the right with the green bars show where were those dollars spent. So what we show here is that we have 20 something percent in, in catalogs. Uh, we have about 20% uh, of those promotion activities in, in uh, trade shows. And then you have internet websites, uh, yellow pages, radio, TV, uh, billboards, gardening publications, etc. So what we did in the analysis is that we grouped some of these uh, promotion activities into three broad categories. And those three broad categories were, were internet uh, promotion activities, uh, printed materials, and mass uh, media promotion and advertising activities. So what we have here on the left, and it's okay if, 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 if you're not very familiar with, uh, with the term elasticity, it's just basically saying what's the response that consumers have to a change in your price. And uh, that this is specifically important because if you have a product that is differentiated, you can uh, increase your price. And if the product is really differentiated, you will expect to sell less, but then overall, uh, revenue for the firm increases. So what we're interested in looking at here is, well, how can we translate that analysis into promotion activities? And again, uh, you can see uh, the bottom of this slide. The full article is uh, published in the Journal of Environmental Horticulture, issue uh, 30 and volume uh, 
And number two, pages 83 to 88, and you can take a look at the overall econometric models, all the formulas that we use. But I'm going to concentrate today in, uh, in the actual results. And as, as you look at this, we have broken down firm size into four different categories. We have uh, small firms, uh, those who sell ten to $250,000, uh, medium firms, 250000 to a million. Uh, large firms from one to five million and very large those who sell uh, over five million dollars. And what we found is that benefit cost ratio, we use those elasticity measure to calculate how much do you get in additional sales for every one dollar invested. And if you remember some of your basic economic concepts, um, you want to keep spending that to maximize your, your profits and you maximize your uh, revenue, you want to uh, increase that until your marginal cost equals your marginal revenue. What does that mean? If I'm spending a dollar in, uh, in promotion and advertising activities and I get a dollar fifty, then you want to keep spending another dollar. If you spend that extra dollar and you still get more than a dollar, you want to continue to do that until you get for every one dollar that you spend, you get a dollar in return. If you invest another dollar after that and you get 80 cents in return, then it doesn't really make any sense for you to uh, invest more. So if you want to maximize your returns, you want to have that benefit cost ratio as close to one as possible, which means that you're really taking advantage of those promotion programs. So let's take a look at that. And what we found is that for very for small firms, those from ten to two hundred and fifty thousand, for every one dollar invested in promotion activities, you get five point nine dollars in additional sales. If you use internet sources, four point five for printed materials, and four point two if you use mass media. The results are similar for medium sized firms, you get a larger return uh, for internet. And then you get about 1.5 and 1.7 for printed materials mass uh, media. Now, as the firm becomes large, you see that maybe there are two issues working here. We didn't find a statistically significant effect of promotion programs in increasing sales. That may be due to the fact that maybe large and very large firms look for their uh, clients in a more larger scale or maybe due to the fact that the expenditures in, inter in the internet can only go so much that after you have your website running and everything else, those are so small compared to overall sales that it's very difficult for us to find a statistically significant effect. And you can see that in those larger firms, uh, printed materials and especially for the very large mass media is really having a, an overall big impact. Now, if you combine all firms of all different sizes, then uh, what you find is that on average you get about $6.3 in return for every dollar invested in printed materials and about mass uh, media about $10. That's for the overall uh, number of firms. So having that in mind, I want to leave you with uh, uh, the title of a book that it might be uh, little bit of an exaggeration, but I've used this as, as something uh, to raise awareness about the, the uh, new realities of now we're really trying to change the paradigm to be a consumer driven uh, world. And, and the title of the book is Satisfied Customers Tell Three Friends, But Angry Customers Tell Three Thousand. And remember that about 80% of the bulk of the business on average is to repeat customers. So keep that in mind when you do your promotion and advertising activities. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer. OK, thank you very much, Marco. That was outstanding. And I apologize to folks at the very beginning. My, this, my particular screen was not showing, so fortunately, uh, Marco's uh, screen was showing throughout the PowerPoint, so we're good to go there. We had a number of good questions uh, asked during the, the uh, webinar, Marco, and I, I answered some of them in direct comments back to the folks. But uh, a couple of other questions had to do with 
you know, obviously advertising makes sense, but it's the, it's the content of the advertising that's that's really the, the the question. So, in generic advertising, you're really trying to increase the size of the pie, right? And and then in terms of uh, brand level uh, advertising or product oriented advertising, like endless endless summer hydrangeas or wave petunias or what have you, you're you're trying to steal a little bigger slice of the pie. So, um, do, as an industry, the question is. And I, I'm doing a lot of paraphrasing here, but do, does the industry need both? Uh, what what is it? Is uh, do we need industry level advertising, and do we need firm level advertising, or can we just get by with firm level advertising? It, that's a that's a very good question. I think that uh, as an industry, we need both, and uh, we have had a couple of generic promotion programs in the past. Unfortunately, uh, because of the nature of the products that we sell, and because of some equity issues, see, they see these programs. In, in order for these programs to work, um, everybody has to share part of that load. That's the main issue that programs that have been successful for over 20 years, 30 years, like the beef program, like the uh, pork program, uh, orange juice program, and some other uh, commodities have been very successful because everybody shares that load. It doesn't matter if you're a grower in Florida. Or if you're a grower in in in, uh, in Washington, or if you're a grower in Central America or Mexico, if you're part of that program, you have to pay the assessments so that everybody can benefit. Uh, I think that part of the reason why the ornamental programs logistically have been uh, difficult to uh, to make them work is because some of those, all of those, have been voluntary, and there have been issues about who really gains from these programs and the free riding issue of people taking advantage of the increase in the map but not putting that in 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 their contributions. So to answer your question, I think it's very important to have that. And as I mentioned in the presentation, it's important to think about how can we get market share from other products that people think about uh, for hobbies, uh, that people think about for gifts, that people think about different seasonality factors. So it's important for us to try and increase that and gain some market share from other industries, but it's also uh, what's going to dictate. And remember the number of firms that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, over 50% of those firms have a relatively new in the industry, and there are a lot of them that are very small. So what's going to uh, dictate whether you're in business next year, whether you're in business in five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road, is how successful you are. To brand, especially if you're a smaller grower, to brand your product, to make sure that the consumer knows about your product, and to make sure that you are selling those products at a profit, that making your message heard, and making sure that those firm messages are uh, there with the product, with the services that you're providing, that's really what's going to, uh, to ensure that you are and remain in business. Absolutely, and of course, in our industry, we have a number of, of existing programs like uh, America in Bloom, and um, you know we have a couple of new ones, plant something or grow something, um, that are in trying to encourage the the increased usage of flower shrubs and trees among consumers at large. And then, of course, we have uh, a number of branding efforts of among uh, some of our firms in the industry. And I think what we need to be careful of is not uh, to get to the point of brand proliferation where we're confusing the consumer. And uh, there's some level of debate as to whether we're there already. But uh, a, a couple of other questions, Marco. Um, one person asked, can they get a copy of your PowerPoint? So you've got your email address right there. And I'm assuming that not only will they be able to view the recorded webinar, that because we are recording as we speak, but if folks need to get a copy of the PowerPoint, they can email you directly. Is that right? Absolutely. I'll be happy to uh, send them a copy of the presentation. Fantastic. Um, one, one, one last question that just came in was, uh, this was from a landscape firm. And uh, they say that uh, as a landscape firm, I feel much of what Marco was saying applied. 
does he feel that there are any great differences that I should consider just in general? So that was the question, Marco. Uh, any, any comment there? I've got my own personal comment I'll add after, after you take a crack at it. Um, yes. Well, in, in terms of the landscaping sector, there are two issues there. One is that it's the main source of, of uh, the buyers. It's the main buyer of, of grower products. But I think it's, it's the same type of general idea. Um, now, it's very difficult. If, if we talk about landscaping, we can break it down into landscaping uh, installation and then landscaping uh, maintenance. And one of the things is, it's difficult to provide, if you think about it, uh, whether is that an homogeneous or a heterogeneous product. Can you have room for differentiation? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, you might think about it and say, well, if you look at the overall result, it's the same. But it's about generating that trust and, and providing value by providing service, going that extra, uh, extra effort to make sure that your customer is happy, to make sure that you are providing them with good value. Uh, oftentimes, and you see that all around, um, that uh, especially in landscaping businesses, that people say, well, it's just landscaping maintenance. If somebody else comes and, 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 and does that for a lower price, people are going to switch. Well, your job is to make sure that uh, what you're doing is providing certain value that your, your customers feel so happy with the service that you provide. And the service is not just the actual uh, uh, maintenance part, but it's also having that connection with them, uh, that you uh, can differentiate your business from the rest, and that people are going to keep coming back to you uh, regardless if somebody else have, has a discounted price or not. Yeah, that's that's well put. Uh, I equate it to a three-legged stool, and you are, you have alluded to two of those three legs: is it comes to value, relevancy, and authenticity. And people will buy products and services as long as they provide value to their to their lives, and they're relevant to their lives, and they're they're offered by authentic firms. They're not they're uh, authentic in the way, in the manner of of the way that they're presenting. Uh, their features and benefits, people actually believe it, and they don't think that that's just a spin on the part of the firm. But that relevancy is, is becoming as critical as, as value is. And you know, we've sold our flowers, shrubs, and trees, and landscapes for many years on the fact that we're pretty, and we've got to sell uh, on more than just pretty in the future. And we have to emphasize those three things. And that relevancy comes not only from the economic benefits of of those flowers and shrubs and trees in the in the landscape, but also the ecosystem services that are provided, and and then lastly the health and well-being benefits. And you know, we don't emphasize the fact that we sell oxygen machines, but and, and uh, we're the answer to stormwater uh, runoff and erosion, and we uh, you know we ha we help people get better faster because of of the, the health benefits. There's a, there's a lot that we as an industry need to emphasize in that terms of that value, relevancy, and authenticity equation that we're not currently doing so. So the nature of our advertising in the future, I think, should be markedly different. And I think a, a number of folks in our industry are picking up on that and starting. Well, and Marco, we've gone uh, a minute and 13 seconds over our allotted time, but we we, uh, we hope it, it was worth it to everyone. Thank you again, folks, for signing in to today's webinar. If you, if you, again, would like a copy of Marco's PowerPoint, his email address is there. Uh, this session is being recorded, and you'll be getting a link to that recording um, if you registered for the, the webinar, which obviously, if you're online, you did. So you'll be getting that in the next 24 hours. Uh, lastly. We have another webinar coming up on August the 13th, and it'll be on social media and how to utilize social media uh, best among green industry firms. So that's uh, another exciting webinar. Marco, thank you very much for your time and your expertise today. Thank all of you folks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.